uh, good evening uh, everybody uh, i welcome all of you to today's uh, session in learning neuroanesthesia and neurocritical care today we have a talk on uh, depth of anesthesia monitoring and uh, the talk uh, today's talk it will be delivered by uh, dr gyaninder Dr. Kyanender, he is an additional uh, professor at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And uh, he's one of the uh, active faculty members in our SNAC uh, group. Today's session, he, it will be moderated by uh, Dr. Joseph Monterio. Uh, Dr. Joseph, are you there? Yes. Yeah. So thanks, Zulfikar, and welcome, Gyanender. Nice to see you after a long time. And uh, I think without further ado, we'll start off on this very interesting topic of depth of anesthesia. And uh, over to you. Would you like to uh, sh share a screen? Yeah. Uh, good evening uh, to everyone. And uh, sir, for, uh, I'm also seeing you after a long time. <laughs> nice <laughs> to see you here. Uh, going directly to the topic, I'm just sharing a screen here. So. And uh, I think the screen is visible. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Yanandar is visible. Okay. So, uh, well, at the outset, I would just like to say that this depth of anesthesia is a topic uh, which we all deal, whether we are in a general anesthesia, new anesthesia, cardiac anesthesia. So, there's something common to everyone. And, uh, you know, uh, it has got a lot of things which we usually do not study. Uh, I would like to cover this topic in two uh, classes. <clears throat> Today, uh, I will try to uh, uh, define certain terms and try to understand what are the basis of uh, monitoring depth of anesthesia. Yeah? And probably next time we will just cover the important monitors and some related uh, literature about it. So starting with this uh, uh, monitoring depth of anesthesia. So let us see what is anesthesia first before we define depth of anesthesia. Anesthesia, as we all know, is loss of uh, sensation. That is how it is defined, actually. The, the, that is how the word anesthesia came from. So it, is, it means loss of sensation, which was first, uh, this term was used by a philosopher, uh, a, a Greek philosopher. Uh, and uh, this word has got two parts. N means without N, anesthesis means sensation. So a word anesthesia means loss of sensation. <laughs> this is how it was defined initially. Now the present term, use of this term anesthesia which is which denotes a sleep like state is credited to credited to oliver wendell holmes okay <clears throat> later on the term called balance anesthesia was given by john Silias Lundi in 1926. So there are many terms which has come one after the other. And balance anesthesia actually is a combination of pre-medication, inhalation anesthesia, including muscle relaxation. Uh, Dr. Gyanander, sorry to disrupt you. Can you just zoom out a little? The slides, your slides, just if it is possible. Uh, this Is it not appearing the full screen? Yeah, yeah, it's coming. It's coming full screen, but it's a little bit too much zoom. If you can just, if it's possible, zoom, you can zoom it out a little. If otherwise it's okay, no issues. Uh, uh, how to do that actually? I uh, We have to go, uh, once you uh, click on the bottom line in full screen, there is an arrow plus minus. So you will have to go towards the minus side. Okay.
it's over zoomed i think that is it's okay saying. it's okay let's man it's okay fine no issues let's continue okay <laughs> so coming next defining about what is general anesthesia now general anesthesia is a reversible loss of controlled consciousness which is achieved by drugs and what is the purpose of doing it to prevent awareness recall distress and movement in patients during undergoing surgery so that is how we define anesthesia so it's a state of controlled unconsciousness achieved by drugs and to prevent awareness recall distress and movement so today the modern anesthesia the objective of this modern anesthesia is to ensure adequate depth of anesthesia and the achievement of modern anesthesia is that today we have the ability to monitor the depth of anesthesia so that is how we can control the proper plane of anesthesia so if we talk of the essential components of a anesthesia that i mean successful anesthesia it would include, include reversible loss of consciousness lack of movement lack of awareness unresponsive to painful stimuli and lack of recall of the surgical intervention all these if forms a, should forms a part of a successful anesthesia there should be no recall of the uh, there should be obviously amnesia loss of movement all awareness and recall should be gone and sh the patient should be unresponsive to any painful stimuli and what is un inappropriate anesthesia anything which is not appropriate whether it is underdose or overdose will form inappropriate anesthesia so inappropriate anesthesia would can be a light anesthesia light pain of anesthesia or can be a deep pain of anesthesia now the important thing is why do we actually need to monitor depth of anesthesia the importance is because in our inappropriate anesthesia will i will cause complications both intraoperatively as well as post operative so there are so many effects which an inappropriate depth of anesthesia can lead to <clears throat> sorry so what are these effects inadequate or light pain of anesthesia would definitely can cause intraoperative awareness and recall in the post op period they can be hemodynamic instability if it, the patient is light you often see see that the patient has tachycardia has hypertension and the, he may be sweating all these kind of hemodynamic responses they can be short and long term cognitive dysfunctions patient in the post op can have anxiety nightmares flashbacks depression and even post traumatic stress disorder so these all are the effects of light pain of anesthesia on the contrary if there is a deep plane you will have the other other uh, spectrum that is they can be bradycardia hypotension because of overdose of the anesthetic drugs cardiac depression can occur arrhythmias can occur and patient may not wake up early after uh, anesthesia so these are the bad effects of it. one of the most concern effect is intraoperative awareness this is because though the incidence they say is quite low 0.2 to 3% but it can be as high as 40% in certain high risk patients say patient is of multiple trauma he is bleeding he is hemodynamically unstable obviously you will keep the plane on a lighter plane of anesthesia keep anesthesia on a lighter plane similarly cardiac patients obstetric patients you do not want depression of the <clears throat> baby or some um, baby airway surgery is where you share airway with the surgeon you might have to have a lower plane of anesthesia <clears throat> in all these conditions the the depth of uh, sorry awareness has been reported as very high and the major effect is the medical legal liability of an anesthesiologist if a anesthesiologist is not able to provide adequate depth he is medically legally he can be charged so <clears throat> so having the knowing the importance of adequate depth of anesthesia may, there were many attempts were made from time to time to define adequate depth of anesthesia initially 
the first attempt was by Bromley in 1847, who described anesthesia in three stages. That is intoxication, excitement, and deeper levels of narcosis. These were the three stages that was described for the first time. Later, John Snow described five stages of narcosis for ether anesthesia. This is very important to remember. These stages were related to ether anesthesia because that was the drug being used at that time. We all know Goodall stages of anesthesia. Arthur E. Goodall in 1937 described four stages of ether anesthesia, which was based on muscle tone, respiratory parameters, and ocular signs. Let's, because this is something widely accepted, let's uh, see what are the stages of ether anesthesia. Stage one, actually it has four stages. Stage one is a stage of analgesia or the stage of disorientation. So what is the stage from? It starts from induction of anesthesia to loss of consciousness. That is the stage one of Goodall uh, stages of anesthesia, ether anesthesia. Then the stage two, that is the stage of excitement or the stage of delirium. That is from, starts from the loss of consciousness to the onset of autonomic breathing. Third comes the stage of surgical anesthesia, where you want your patient to be. It, it is from the onset of autonomic respiration to the respiratory paralysis. Now, this stage is again divided into four things. As you can see, they are from autonomic respiration to cessation of eyeball movement is explained one. Then from cessation of eyeball movement to the beginning of intercostal muscle paralysis, that is stage two. Plane three for big, from beginning of beginning to completion of intercostal muscle paralysis. So this two and three is somewhere the stages where we want our patient to be during SA, especially we want to have plane two, because as you enter plane three and plane four, the depth becomes deeper and deeper, and that is called deep anesthesia. Plane four is when there is a complete intercostal and diaphragmatic paralysis. So after death, after this, the next stage comes is the stage of respiratory paralysis where there is stoppage of respiration and eventually the death can occur. So these are the stages of anesthesia, which was defined by Goodell's. <clears throat> Later on, Ortiz in 1954 actually further divided a Google stage first into three planes. Like the patient do not experience amnesia or analgesia is the plane one. Then patient is completely amnesic in phase two, but experience only partial analgesia. And in plane three, uh, plane three, he is he is amnesic as well as analgesic. So these he further divided this. Having said that, this is important to remember that these classifications were designed for inhalation anesthetic present at that time, that is ether, without use of muscle relaxant or IV induction agent as in the present scenario. Also, these classification depends upon muscular movement, including respiratory muscles. So to, in today's world, where the use of muscle relaxant and IV induction agents is so common, these stages and where the use of ether has been discontinued, these Goodell's classification now regarded as, as obsolete. Okay. So now we have newer ways of defining stages of anesthesia. Griffith and John recognize the four stages of awareness. Later on, he did his, uh, they recognized four stages of awareness, where the fourth stage, fourth stage was actually uh, equivalent to a deep anesthesia with no awareness or recall. So these stages were conscious awareness. The stage of awareness during anesthesia include four stages. That is conscious awareness with explicit recall, consciousness, aware, conscious awareness with no explicit, explicit recall, then subconscious awareness with implicit recall, and finally, no awareness or recall that is deep anesthesia. This is how they were defined. <clears throat> so after understanding that there were a lot of attempts to define 
proper stages of anesthesia and what plane of anesthesia we should keep. Is there any way to measure these measure depth of anesthesia? Yes. They are few. And we all know about them, like clinical parameters, which we can say autonomic response. We always find that with change in the depth of anesthesia, there is a change in the autonomic response of a patient. They can be hemodynamic changes, like tachycardia or bradycardia, hypertension or hypotension, depending upon the depth of anesthesia. If the light pain of anesthesia, we would have tachycardia and hypertension, or in deeper planes, we may have bradycardia and hypotension. Similarly, changes can be with respiratory changes. They can be body movements, sweating, lacrimation, pupillary dilatation, etc. All these autonomic responses can guide you about the depth of anesthesia. But the problem is not only these parameters, but other things like drugs, beta blockers, atro uh, atropine, vasodilators, inotropes, dexmedometry, muscle relaxant, opioids, all these drugs can affect your hemodynamic parameters or autonomic responses. Again, we have conditions like anemia, blood loss, fever, dehydration, hypo or hyperthermia, they will change your uh, autonomic response. So whether the change is because of the depth of anesthesia or it is the drug effect or there is a, say, bleeding is happening, there is a blood loss and there is a tachycardia. So we, are, we cannot differentiate between. So this autonomic response, though can give you some guidance, but it cannot be completely relied upon. So that's not a reliable method of depth of anesthesia. <laughs> then they started forming scores or indices. And there was scores and indices were formed based on several parameters, right? So like the most common or very popular score we all know about is PRST score, that is pressure, heart rate, sweating, and tear production. So here we take all four components together and form a scoring system. And based on the scores, we can say the whether the depth, anesthetic depth is adequate or not. Let's see how. In this table, if you are able to see the four comp component, that is increasing the systolic blood pressure, Increase in heart rate, sweating, and tears. These are the four parameters which we take. And then if there are scores given to for each parameter from 0, 1, and 2. So if there's an increase in systolic blood pressure, which is less than 15 mm of Hg from the baseline, it is given zero score. From 15 to 30 mm of Hg increase from baseline is given score one, and more than 30 mm Hg from baseline is given score two. Similarly, this is for heart rate. For sweating, if there is no sweating nil, if there is a skin moist, we give score one. And if there are visible droplets of sweats, we give it two. Then tears, no tears in open eyes, zero. Excess tears in the open eyes is given score one. And tears which are overflowing are given two. Now, based on the scoring system, the depth of anesthesia is estimated by summing of all the points obtained by these parameters, from these parameters. Score, when the total score is more than three, is considered that the depth is inadequate. So anything beyond three, so number should be less, less or equal to three for, to define, to say that it is a adequate depth of anesthesia. This PR, PRSC score or Evans score, which was actually given 1984 by Evans and Davis, actually demonstrated huge variability and low agreement with the criteria of depth of anesthesia. So again, this is again, though it gives you some guidance, it cannot be fully relied upon. There are other indices like quantification of perspiration or sweating which is nothing but the skin conductance. It is observed that the skin conduction is increased as the depth of anesthesia increases and vice versa.
but the skin sweat skin conduct uh, conduction which is basically an indicator of stress response or and it is the quantification of perspiration factors which affect sweating like atrophying or autonomic dystrophy can reduce the accuracy of this kind of score so ultimately all these scores and dices shows variability and poor correlation with anesthetic depth so though they can give you some idea about the depth but they they can be lot of variations from patient to patient and thus the reliability of these scores another important technique which has been described in literature is isolated forearm technique to monitor the adequate level of depth of anesthesia now how how it is done a tourniquet is tied over the arm and inflated above the systolic blood pressure to isolate the arm from the rest of the circulation before administering the muscle relaxant now what will happen is thus the arm is free to move during anesthesia because this arm will not be uh, uh, will not be paralyzed because of the muscle relaxant because you have cut off the blood supply but not to forget that ischemia has to be prevented by period periodically releasing the tourniquet and before giving any top up of muscle relaxant so this is a technique and now under anesthesia the patient is asked to move his fingers to check the adequacy of depth of anesthesia whether the patient is able to hear it and follow the commands so we check it by asking the patient to perform a movement of the fingers a purposeful movement in response to a verbal command indicates that the patient is able to understand our commands and do the action and so the depth of anesthesia is light or it is inadequate but this isolated form technique again has got many limitations as a monitor for depth of anesthesia first thing they can be non specific response which may be interpreted as consciousness that is one drawback second is levels of anesthesia need now in present days see level of anesthesia needed to prevent movement in patients using isolated forearm technique are significantly higher than those routinely used since the advent of mr now presently what happens with the use of muscle relaxant you don't need to give a very very high dose of anesthesia to prevent movement uh, to prevent movement so unnecessarily by using this technique we may be giving more anesthesia so that actually can be a deeper plane of anesthesia also patients have reported that they could hear the command but were unable to move the isolated arm though the nerve stimulator suggested that the arm is not paralyzed so this is again a non reliability factor thus isolated form technique is again not a very reliable method in the for monitoring depth of anesthesia <clears throat> so various methods we have just learned that is autonomic response or indices like psrt scoring system or isolated forearm technique all these are subjective methods and they are not very very reliable so the search for objective parameters for measuring depth of anesthesia was looked at so what are the objective methods of uh, to measure depth of anesthesia <clears throat> now objective method one is one of them is spontaneous surface emg that is electromyo graphy uh emg it is the electrical activity of the muscles now this can be used in unparalyzed or partially paralyzed individuals only <clears throat> because once you give a muscle relaxant you cannot record the emg activity so what is done is the emg electrode is placed over the skin surface on the various muscle groups especially on the facial muscles or abdominal or neck muscles what they say is what they have it has been observed that with the increase in the depth of anesthesia the the emg activity reduces and 
with four and EMG. Uh, and again, when the patient becomes awake, the EMG activity starts regained, is regained. That is, this fall in EMG activity with deepening anesthesia and better EMG activity with light, lighter pain of us. So this can be used as a monitor to monitor, uh, for monitoring depth of anesthesia. But however, it was found that the scales were not absolute and there was wide variability in the response between the patients. Again, the reliability of this method is less. So there was another uh, method or objective method, which was discovered, which was found that is known as lower esophageal contractility. Lower esophageal contractility, the, that is the recording of the contractions from the lower esophageal smooth muscles. Now, advantage of this method is that these are smooth muscles. And so the muscle relaxation will not affect them. So these can be, these, this method to measure depth of anesthesia can be used even with patients in which muscle relaxation has been given, unlike the previous one, which records EMG activity, and you have to, it has, can only be given in patients who are not paralyzed. What, what is done in this method? See, the lower esophageal muscles, they contract spontaneously, or they can be made to contract by stimulation. So we can record both spontaneous contractions, that is spontaneous lower esophageal contract, contractions and provoked, that is PLOC, provoked lower esophageal muscle contractions. So, and this can be provoked by inflating a balloon placed in the lower esophagus. And, and the contractions are recorded by the pressure transducers placed near it. What has been observed is that with increase in depth of anesthesia, the frequency of contractions as well as the amplitude of contractions of lower esophageal smooth muscle decre decreases. So with, whenever there is an increase in the depth of anesthesia, there is a decrease in the amplitude and frequency of contractions of the lower esophageal muscles and the vice versa. That is it happens reverse when the patient is reversed. Now, frequency of contractions can predict movement in response to skin incision during potent inhaled anesthetics. What does it mean? It means that suppose if the contractions are 10, <laughs> the patient is likely to ha have movement. But if the contractions are seen as less than five, the patient is, will, is likely that he will not move with the skin incision or will not respond to the skin incision. So by monitoring the contraction, lower esophageal contraction, the frequency of these contraction, uh, you can predict whether the patient is going to respond to the skin incision. That means whether the patient is having adequate pain of anesthesia or he is not having adequate pain. So this is how this can be, this can work out. Now these both spontaneous and provoked lower esophageal contractions are measured using a balloon and pressure transducers in the lower esophagus. It has been observed that combining the measurement of spontaneous lower esophageal contractions frequency and provoked lower uh, esophageal contraction amplitude can improve the information derived from these uh, uh, these indices, because they can, you can drive a esophageal contractility index, OIC, which is called it. What is esophageal contractility index? Here, you are actually taking two components. One is spontaneous lower esophageal contractility, uh, frequency of the spontaneous lower esophageal contractility and amplitude of the provoked lower esophageal contractility. 
you and once you put this into a formula and once you add them and multiply by 70 this gives you an esophageal contractility index and this is a better parameter compared to the frequency or amplitude alone so this uh, this is one of the method which can be the objective method which can you use in patient to define the depth of anesthesia even in paralyzed patients OIC is easy to interpret and can be used in muscle relaxation. That is the advantage. However, at present, the data of this kind of depth of monitoring available is quite low. And so, and it's not widely used because uh, one, one we say is the depth uh, data is less. Secondly, it's a bit invasive procedure. So this is not a very uh, favored kind of monitor used for depth of analysis. So what's next? Do we have another thing? Yes. Heart rate variability. <clears throat> heart rate variability. This is an, something like we have a pulse rate variability and all those things. This, there is one entity called as heart rate variability. And quite a, in, investigated beat to beat variability of heart rate and observed it may provide useful information of for monitoring depth of anesthesia. What you observe is that the variability of heart rate, B to beat variability, can be used for monitoring depth of anesthesia. Why he said so? Because heart rate, rate variability coincides with the frequency of ventilation. That means heart rate increases during inspiration and decreases during expiration. This is actually called as sin respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Whenever the normal person inspires, the heart rate slightly goes high. And when he expires, the air out, there is a decrease in the heart rate. So this variation in the heart rate can be used for to monitoring depth of anesthesia. How it is done? Let us see. See, this sin, respiratory sinus arrhythmia can be easily monitored from the ECG monitor. And they say more than 10% variation in the EGP waveform interval, that is from P to P. If we take the interval from P to P on the EEG, and if there is a variation of more than 10% over five minutes, uh, we record for five minutes, and let's see if there's a variation of more than 10%, that is the variability indexes, uh, that heart rate variability is there. Why this variability occurs? First of all, let us understand why this uh, variability occurs. There is a parasympathetic reflex connecting stretch receptors in the lungs, and aorta to the vagal mo motor neurons innovating the heart. Let me explain this. <clears throat> See, whenever we inspire, there is an increase in the thoracic pressure. There is a stretching of lungs. There is a stretching of aorta. This stretching sends a, sends a uh, signal to the vagal motor neuron in the brain stem. And what, is to, what does it do? It will inhibit the parasympathetic outflow. That means during inspiration, the parasympathetic outflow will go down and there will be an increase in the heart rate. And on the contrary, when there is expiration, the stretching will decrease. The impulse will go to the uh, vagal motor neurons in the brainstem and will prevent the inhibition of parasympathetic outflow. That means the parasympathetic outflow will increase and therefore there will be a decrease in the heart rate. I hope I am um, I have made you clear. If not, you can put me in the chat box. I will just repeat it again. Let me tell you once again, whenever there is inspiration, there is a stretch receptors in the lungs and are stimulated. They send signal to the vag vagal motor neurons in the brain stem thereby inhibiting the vehicle outflow and increase in the heart rate and the reverse happen during expiration. So there is a change in the heart rate during inspiration and expiration, which happens and this is called as respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Okay. Now this reduction in the, what will happen is this is the normal phenomenon which is happening. Now, whenever there is an anesthesia, when there is an anesthesia is given, this respiratory sinus arrhythmia or variability decreases. 
why the when the patient becomes awake this variability increases so this change in variability of heart rate variability it can be can guide us whether that depth is adequate or not this is how that is the depth is measured several studies have actually shown the level of uh, respiratory sinus arrhythmia reflects the level of depth of anesthesia but again as most of the previous uh, methods had some limitation the limitation here is this method depends upon the intact autonomic nervous system plus the healthy myocardial conducting system if any of this either autonomic nervous system or myocardial conducting system is affected you cannot get the correct idea similarly beta blockers conduction abnormalities autonomic neuropathy can affect the uh, these affect the value so this will again will not be a very reliable method this phantom monitor is based on this heart rate variability parameters and which is which has been uh, but has got a very limited uh, experience with uh, we have very limited experience so this though this is one of the method you can use for monitoring depth of anesthesia but again the reliability remains low now coming back to our methods of assessing depth of anesthesia we saw there are subjective methods like autonomic response psrt isolated uh, forearm technique which were not very reliable so we jumped on to find new methods which included objective methods like surface spontaneous surface emg then we have lower esophageal contractility heart rate variability but then again we have here also though we have some objective method to assess the depth of anesthesia the reliability is not very high so what is the next this led to the further search for better depth of anesthesia monitors and in search of better depth of anesthesia monitor which are objective reproducible and continuous measurement of, and gives us continuous measurement depth of anesthesia we uh, discovered two an anesthesia uh, two monitors which are called eg based and aep that is elect eg based monitors and of course uh, evoke potential uh, uh, monitors aep monitors acoustic evoke potential based monitors so these two technologies or techniques were used to determine uh, to detect the depth of anesthesia and the best part of these kind of monitors is that they enable continuous monitoring even when the patient has got lost all responsive to electrical stimuli okay because you are recording the electrical activity right from the right from the <coughs> brain okay eeg activity from the brain so even when the pa patient has got no reflexes external to external stimuli you can record these activities and you can monitor the depth of anesthesia so coming next so we have these kind of pointers available with us today where to monitor depth of anesthesia they are eeg based monitors and evoke potential based monitors now let us see one them one by one eeg based monitors we have uh, there are certain indices uh, drive indices which gives us an idea about the uh, depth of anesthesia like we have compressed spectral array spectral edge frequency scf commonly known as or median frequency these are various parameters which are uh, presently uh, used as to give us the idea about the depth of anesthesia then bis i know every one of us know about this and this is probably the most widely used and <clears throat> very simplified form of <clears throat> monitoring depth of anesthesia followed by we have entropy from g then narco train index and then several other monitors were dry, uh, were uh, discovered or like patient index state index snap index cerebral state index index of consciousness and so on so all these monitors actually depends upon the eeg activity <clears throat> or i would say spontaneous eeg activity from the brain then another way of monitoring is evoke potentials that is 
we provoke something we evoke the response and then monitor the potentials so there uh, this kind of monitor includes somato sensory evoke potentials visual evoke potentials so here we stimulate like auditory evoke potentials we stimulate and then we record the eg activity and see whether the depth of nsi is adequate or not auditory evoke potential index a line auto regressive index they all are the monitors which depends on evoke potential uh, uh, for measurement of depth of nsi now let us go into share one by one to each of them <clears throat> now before i go into the depth of these monitors i would like to clarify certain terms which would be used and uh, during the further course of uh, the lecture and also will help us understanding the basis of uh, the functioning of these monitors first is electroencephalogram what is that this is nothing but the record of the electrical activity of the brain that is eeg which is actually recorded using electrodes placed over the scalp right and we get this kind of graph so here if we see the graph it is something a very irregularly irregular trace something very similar to ventricular fibrillation right so from this can we derive something how can we define uh, find depth of nsi from such a graph actually actually seeing on the left hand side you are observing this is the eeg which we get from the monitor eeg right these are eeg trace but actually these eeg trace are made up of multiple components of different waves they are waves of different frequencies which together forms this kind of trace and if we can segregate these waves from these trace we will have different uh, waves of different frequencies you can see each of these graph will have all these waves and when they fuse they give like this kind of pattern okay so these kind what i mean to say is each eeg graph can be broken into different waves with different frequencies as you can see on the right hand side these are called human brain waves if we see these ecg waves have got different uh, different frequency wave band, uh, frequency bands and depending on the frequency wave band they are defined by different names like we have alpha beta gamma delta theta all this so delta wave has got a frequency of 0.3 to 0.4 theta have for 4 to 8 hertz that is waves per second hertz to wave per second alpha 18 to 13 30 waves per second beta would have 13 to 30 waves per second and anything anything above 30 would be a, will form the gamma waves on the right side we can see gamma waves are see how the frequency is very high then in beta they the frequency is slightly lower than the gamma waves coming down alpha has got a further less frequency but the amplitude has become higher theta the frequency has gone further down and amplitude is increasing and lastly if you see delta the amplitude is high but the frequency is almost very very low that is 0.3 to 0.4 waves over 1 second so this is a trace of 1 second here you can see one wave two wave three wave and four wave but here the frequency is very high over 30 here the frequency is around 13 to 30 8 to 10 8 to 13 4 to 8 and 3 to 0.3 to 4 so these what i mean to say this kind of trace can be broken into these wavelengths or spectrum of frequencies here yeah. the importance is when the patient is alert you have these high frequency and low amplitude waves the waves which are coming over the eeg is eeg monitor would be the these types beta waves and uh, gamma waves and as you the patient goes sleepy drowsy and sleepy the 
the frequency or the waveform will change into that theta and delta waves. That is low frequency and high amplitude waves. You can see here, gamma where you require very high concentration, beta would have an active mind. Then when the patient is on, on a person is on rest, he would have a ripple, uh, restful kind of uh, waves would be like, then patient become drowsy and ultimately sleeping. So from awake to sleep, there is a change in the waveform pattern. Now, this is not only during up, going from awake to sleep. If you go, if you see, the, the similar change is seen when the patient is sedated or hypnosis, or there is a hypnosis and that is anesthetized. Initially, the pattern would be like this, that is awake EG. Then, the, as the patient becomes slightly, uh, I mean, start losing consciousness, the, the, the waveform becomes low, low in frequency. And where, as you can see here, they become slow waves. Then ultimately, what is hap happen is they would have burst suppression. Burst suppression is when for some period of time, there is no activity of the brain. Some, some part will have activity, then other part will not have it. That, that is, you will start having burst suppression. This is the plane when it, you call it it's a deep anesthesia. And ultimately, if you go further, that anesthetic gap is increased further, you will have Bur isoelectric line, no, 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 uh, there is isoelectric line that is no uh, electrical activity will be observed. So, like this patient goes from awake to sleep, similar changes are observed from during anesthesia. And this change in the pattern of waves has is captured by the depth of anesthesia monitors to define the depth of anesthesia or adequate level of anesthesia. <clears throat> so, uh, let's just uh, uh, look at a few more terms. <laughs> what is rho electro EEG? The rho EEG is a, comp small, is a complex small uh, voltage fluctuations which are very, very low in amplitude or micro, that is just one to five micro volts, which, can, which are difficult to read and interpret. So what these monitors do, if you want to read these things, the, these monitors will filter them. That is, they will remove the artifacts and amplify the signals so that the brain activity can be read. Now, the cerebral frequency analyzing monitors filters the ECG and then divide them into various frequency bands. I have told you there were five frequency bands. Okay, one, two, one, two, three, four, five. Different, having different frequency bands and different waveforms. So they are divided into five frequency bands, plus one is, uh, one is added, one trace is added, which tells you about the burst suppression, that is no electric activity. So in all six bands, they will divide, divide. they will divide the EEG wave into frequency bands, that is high frequency, then lower frequency, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and ultimately coming to the burst suppression. This is how they will divide the EEG band. The modern monitors actually process the raw EEG and obtain an EEG signals, analog signal by filtering and amplifying, and then display the information in the form of either graphical, such as compressed spectral array, or numerical parameters such as spectral edge frequency or median frequency. I know these terms are difficult to understand. I will try to make it as easy as possible for you. What happens? <laughs> so. Till now, what I am trying to say is, uh, EEG, which is a very small uh, microvolt recording from the brain and very complex, which is difficult to analyze, is actually processed by monitors. They are filtered so that artifacts are removed, the signals are amplified, and later on, these, sig uh, these signals are divided into various frequency bands, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, all these, and isoelectric line. And then they display the information either in a graphical manner or a numerical parameter. So graphical manner is called as, example is compressed spectral array or numerical parameter like spectral edge frequency or median frequency. Let's see what are these. You must have, if you have gone through depth of anesthesia, you must have heard this term, fast Fourier 
transformation. What is that? In simple terms, it is just an algorithm, algorithm which converts a digital signal over time. If you see this figure, this is the this is the signal which is coming. You can see there are multiple waves here, here. I'm using a pointer to show you. Uh, just a minute. See, this is the this is how the signals are coming. They are waves of various frequencies which are coming. Okay, and this is the time over the over say time of five seconds. So this is suppose the signal we have received. What this fast Fourier transformation does is that the algorithm will break this this signal into various into waves of different frequencies. So it will isolate waves of this frequency. It will isolate waves of this frequency. It will isolate waves of this frequency. So you can see here, this is one, this is another band, this is another band. That means we are receiving signals. <clears throat> this has got three band of frequencies. Few waves are in this band, few waves are in this band, and few waves are in this band. To make it more clear, let's see this. See, this is a recording from a signal, <clears throat> recording from an electrode, suppose. You can see all these waveforms are similar and have the similar frequency. Frequencies means number of waves per second. So if you see from here to here, one second, there are three waves. Then from here to here, there also there are three waves. Here also three waves. Actually, these waveforms belong to one frequency. Now, what will FFT to FFT does? It will define that where are the waveforms lying. Here, if you can see, after analysis, all the waveforms are of frequency three. So, lying between zero to ten here, and hundred percent waveforms are of same frequency. So, you have just one graph here. Is that clear? All these waveforms are of same frequency. So after FFT, that is fast wave transformation algorithm, it only found that only one frequency waves are present. So all 100% waves were of the same frequency. Now, see another example. Here, we have another signal. Here, we can see there are two types of waves. This wave till here has got different frequency and then here, different frequency. See the frequency one, two, three, four, five. In one second, there are five. The frequency, there are five waves, so frequency is five. Here also the frequency is five. So you can see at frequency five, there are two waves. <laughs> for two seconds, you can see that the, they were, the waves were for of frequency five. After this point to this point, here they are one, two, three, four, five, 15. So from two to three seconds, you can see the frequency has gone to 15. So another peak has come at 15. And then from three to three and a half second, you have another, this wave also 15 seconds. So this one and a half signal is from 15. So you see this time and wave were divided into frequency. So that means this, if you want to divide into bands, we have divided into two bands. This is the band width of five and bands of 15. I hope I am making you clear. Basic, the simple thing is we are dividing the waveforms, erratic waveforms into frequency bands. So what will happen next? Suppose this is the waveform or EEG signal. Now we have divided into three frequency bands. One is four, to her, four hertz, eight hertz, and 32 hertz. And we will know, we'll try to find how many waves were in the lower frequency band, higher in the intermediate frequency band, how many are the higher frequency band. Because the more the waves in the higher frequency band means the patient is more light or depth of anesthesia is low. Similarly, if there is more waves in the lower frequency band, that means the patient, the, pa the depth is deep. And if they are in the low, medial, medial range, there is an adequate depth of anesthesia. So this is how the depth of anesthesia is quantified using the waveforms. Uh, just to cover up uh, two more terms, that is power spectrum. 
whatever the power spectrum is nothing but whatever we obtain from FFT, that is fast Fourier transformation. If we just square the values, we will get what is called as power spectrum. So simply, it is the square of the values obtained by FFT. Just that much we need to remember. And when we plot this power spectrum against frequency, the graph which is obtained is called as frequency distribution of E. You can see this. Here on one axis, you have power spectrum. Other, you have frequency. I, I want to make this clear because uh, this will explain you what is complex uh, uh, spectral array. Compressed spectral array. This will make you clear. So suppose you have power spectrum on one and frequency on other. This is the graph, the plot which is obtained. This gives you the frequency distribution of EEG. To understand this, let us un understand what is compressed frequency array. The, the individual distribution joined together into a 3D plot, generating three dimension hill and valley display is called as compressed spectral array. So don't go into this definition, which is look so complex. Just see that if you plot power against frequency, this is the graph we get, okay? Now, if we do what happens, we take one graph at this moment. We take another graph up at second time point. We keep, take another graph at third time point. So if we plot on if we plot power on y-axis and frequency on z x-axis, so we get this graph, power on y-axis and frequency on x-axis. So this is a time one. If we plot multiple graphs at different times at z-axis, so this is power, this is frequency, and this is time. So at time t0, this is the first graph is this. I hope you are seeing the pointer. At time t1, there is another graph behind this. At third time t3, there is another graph behind this. And so at if, with time four, five, six on the z-axis, if we plot this, this is a three-dimensional plot we get. This kind of three-dimensional plot we get is called as compre compressed spectral array. What, why I need to tell you all this? Because this will tell you the depth of anesthesia. How it will tell you depth of anesthesia? Let, let me explain you once again. To explain it once again, power and frequency are when plotted gives this kind of graph. Okay. When you, when you plot this graph against time, power, frequency on Z and Y axis, and time on Z axis, so we have with time one, time two, time three, time four, time five, we would have multiple graphs, one behind the other, placed like this on Z axis. And this kind of plot, which is nothing but a 3D plot generating three-dimensional hill and valley display is called as spec compressed spectral array. So how, how it tells us about depth of anesthesia? See, if you see this graph, these are the frequencies, delta, beta, alpha, theta, delta. Beta is a high frequency, alpha is lower, Theta is there and delta is the lowest frequency. So in ty at time T0 here, we can see the highest peak is in the lower frequency. But as the time goes over and the last graph, we can see that the waveforms are started generating here. Whereas these peaks have gone down. If you see the peaks at, in the lower uh, frequency zone that is delta and theta almost become flattened in the posterior most graph but new waveforms have started generating which are in the higher frequency zone this means that de as the time is passing the depth of anesthesia the waveform is changing from low high, uh, lower frequency to higher frequency that means the patient is getting away or the depth is getting down this is the, how we can find the depth of anesthesia. Let me explain once more. 
compressed spectral array has been used to de define depth of uh, anesthesia. During deeper plane of anesthesia, the peaks are shifted from higher frequencies to lower frequencies. So in the deeper plane, you can see the frequencies in the, in the peak are in the lower frequency zone. But in lighter plane of anesthesia, the peaks would be in the higher frequency zone. See this graph. <clears throat> this is the time. These are the peaks. And this is the frequency. So at time here, the peak is in the lower frequency zone. That is 6 hertz. That means patient is, under, is deep anesthesia. But at this time here, if you see, the, frequent, the peak is at 13 to 17 hertz for 15 hertz zone. That means the frequency is high. So higher frequency means patient is awake. Lower frequency means patient is anesthetized. So seeing this trend over time, you can see whether the patient is becoming light, whether the patient is becoming dark, deep, deep, or whether depth of anesthesia. I hope this has cleared you. While at recovery, there is a progressive increase in the amount of high frequency activity with corresponding decrease in low frequency. So suppose the patient is recovering. Here the patient is recovering with time. So the frequent, the peak has changed from low frequency, that is six, six hertz, to peak has changed to 15 hertz. That means high frequency zone. That means from low to high frequency zone. And that means the patient is becoming light or the patient is being reversed. This is how the depth of anesthesia can be monitored, monitored by complex spectral array. So, okay. So, very good. So, with this, we can now very easily define depth of anesthesia. But wait, it's not that easy again. Although it looks more compact than raw EEG, still it is a very complex display. Takes time to understand. And of course, changes within it are difficult to quantify. Moreover, there are problems like there is a great patient and agent variability and confounding factors such as hypoxia is there, hypotension is there, hypercarbia is there. They will also cause changes in the frequency of the EG wave. So all, having said that, this monitor, when used alone, cannot again be relied upon the depth of the So, So compressed uh, spectral array is one of the monitor which can guide you to tell how is the trend going on, but for, or singly, sing for you can use alone, it is not very light. So what happened was, there were further attempts to derive other simple uh, monitors. There we don't need to have very complex understanding, so that we have simple single figure numeric indices, which can be derived from spectral analysis of array. And this led to a development of three indices, spectral edge frequency, median frequency, and bispectral index frequency. Okay, I'll just, uh, Dr. Uh, Zulfika, can I uh, just finish these basic things and then we can uh, go on because I know this is a bit theoretical, but then uh, uh, if you have permit me, I'll just finish off these three things and then we can can I take more rest monitors next time. Yes, Dr. GP Singh, you can. Okay, so uh, I'll just finish the three terms, three, four terms, then we'll take the practical part of these monitors next, uh, in the next lecture. So three indices. Three indices, let's first see spectral edge frequency. What is spectral edge frequency? It's nothing. Value below which 95% of EG power is contained. If we have this graph of power and frequency, and you can see, here we say it is, spectral edge frequency 90 or 95, whatever we define. That means below, this is the frequency below which most 90% of the waveform are lying. That is called spectral edge frequency. Another term is median frequency. Median frequency is when 50% of values of this graph are on the right side and 50% on the left side. So they're distributed here on both sides. This is mean. Both these parameters has found to correlate well uh, with clinical science using numerous anesthetic agents for depth of anesthesia. So they say spectral edge frequency, if below this value, will say that will say 
that the patient is adequately anesthetized. That means the, if the 90% of frequency or 95% of the total power is lying below this frequency range, that means the patient is adequately anesthetized. Similarly, median frequency, they also define that median frequency is less than this is uh, means that is the patient is adequate, is adequate depth of anesthesia. Higher than this, the patient is not adequate. So usually spectralized frequency, there is less than 15 or 16 at the max, 12 to 13 to 16. If, ha if you have the 90% of the your power spectrum is below this frequency range, then the patient is usually adequate. For median frequency, they is around five to six. This is. So these are the parameters which is, uh, are more easier to understand. Or uh, uh, to if your median, the values are coming on your monitor SEF, it is say twelve. So that gives you an idea. Yes, the spectralized frequency is in the range, and so the patient is adequately anesthetized. You don't have to uh, analyze the graphs or uh, uh, the spectrum over the uh, monitor. Similarly, if you have values of median frequency less than five or six, you say, okay, the patient is is adequate. So these are better as compared to the previous uh, uh, factors. There are various uh, uh, monitors which use these kind of things. Philips EEG um, big, uh, measurement module is there, which now uh, they use two channels that just they collect EEG from by using two channels and they give you a compressed spectral array, total power, percentage of power in each brand, spectralized frequency, mean, uh, yeah, median frequency, power peak frequency, all these factors will be displayed on the monitor. And seeing these patterns, you can actually identify whether the uh, patient is having adequate depth or not. You see, this is how the graph will look. Here you will see this, these are the power are distributed into various frequency zones. Spectral edge frequency is somewhere around 18. Median edge frequency is around, uh, say, 9. So probably you need a little more better depth of anesthesia than this. Okay. Then you have cerebral function monitor. This is again uh, using a single biparietal temp bitemporal lead to obtain EG signal, which are actually processed by filtering and uh, applying algorithms. Then output is displayed as a slow chart. That is a, a trace is given. Very uh, trace, very slow trace comes. That is speed of at the one millimeter per minute. And actually, this represents the overall cortic, uh, electrocortical background activity of the brain. So it does not give you EEG signal, but the uh, average of the EEG signals. And uh, high reading on the chart indicates high activity, and low indicates low activity, which can be used to monitor depth of anesthesia. These are the cerebral function monitor. There is another monitor called cerebral function analysis monitor. It is also similar to that, where the EEG signals are processed and traces are formed, which gives you mean amplitude, power amplitude in various frequency band. And seeing them, you can see the adequate depth or not. So basically, you are getting numbers, indices, by which you can uh, uh, say whether depth is there or not. But even this actually has got multiple. Uh, confounders. And because of these, they are also not very preferred uh, ways of monitoring anesthesia, but they are much better than what we have seen. Next is the BIS. <laughs> I think BIS, uh, 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 BIS and entropy and narcotin, I think we can take in the next class because this has become more of theoretical. That would be more of practical aspects what we monitor in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, what the operation theaters. So I think we can start the base and other uh, commonly used monitors next time so that uh, people can understand. But these uh, parameters, which all be, which are also displayed by our uh, monitors like this, you can now understand what is the importance of these uh, parameters, I hope. Uh, Dr. Zorosov, sir. Yeah. Uh, is it, is Thank you, uh, Dr. G.P. Singh. There's a question from Dr. Pooja. Yeah. Please explain power and power spectrum again. OK. So I'll go to the slide. See, uh, I would say the best, you don't go into the very much physics about it or details. Simply, when you get it, uh, FFT, that is fast Fourier transformation, 
the values you get by these these are the various uh, frequency wave band waves you have got now simply by obtaining the square of these values you get the power spectrum that is how it is defined okay so it's just by power spectrum is that it just uh, multi is do the square of the various waveform what is the uh, you have got the power uh, sorry uh, during the fft these values which are obtained by this uh, fast fourier transformation when you do an square of these values you will get the power spectrum and when you when the power is plotted against the frequency you get this kind of graph this is called as the frequency distribution graph and when multiple graphs of frequency distribution are plotted against time you will have the compressed spectral array csa this is the simplest way to understand that uh yeah and there's another question from dr swati yeah median frequency less than 5 is adequate depth is there any value for spectral edge frequency spec sef uh, uh it's range of 12 to uh, 15 or 16 there are various books mention different range uh like like 5 to 6 is for uh, median and from 12 to 16 or uh, 15 or 16 they say for sef that is 90% 95% of the frequencies should lie below this values okay i think uh... thank you gyanender and uh, dr zulfikar are we going to continue next time uh, yes sir uh, we will continue next week the same lecture will request dr uh, dr gyanender to continue it and uh, then we'll move to the other lectures next wednesday we'll continue yes. with the same talk yeah so i'll do i'll are, do yeah and I'll do thank you any of our students any of thank the you. participants we can continue next week thank you so much gyan uh, Really, lot of gyan you distributed today, <laughs> and you, I can see, see the hard work and knowing you as a very meticulous person who is very mathematical in his approach. This is uh, it is not a surprise that you prepared this lecture with so much of detailing, which is good. I wish I was less tired than what I am just now. I would have absorbed much more. But <laughs> any other time, I'm going to catch you again to get this lecture for a smaller group in a in a in better times in the day day time someday. because this has been meticulously prepared very very typical of you it really reflects the kind of person you are you've gone into all details so extremely impressive and thank you so much thank you so thank much thank you so much ma'am for those kind words and uh, yeah. i hope people would benefit out of it and i'll continue with the rest part of it next time definitely definitely thank you thank you so much okay over to dr zulfikar and i think if there are no more questions and comments we can end the class for today Uh, sure. Thank you once again. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gyanender, for preparing such an exhaustive class. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Zulfi. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, everyone, for joining, and uh, let's meet next time again. Thank Thanks you. a lot.